could say I met, but I first saw Pastor Alex preach when I was in seminary. He came to preach for some of our chapels, uh, as well as at Grace Community Church when I was growing up. And um, I think probably one of the scariest experiences of my life was to go and preach at their church one Sunday. And um, having Pastor Alex sitting there in the front row, uh, watching me preach like through two services. And uh, I just remember thinking, uh, okay, I know I shouldn't fear, man, but I'm still very afraid. But uh, he was very gracious and uh, bought, bought us lunch afterwards. So I, I think uh, that, that started off kind of just uh, my personal experience with Pastor Montoya. And over the years, he has been such an encouragement, especially uh, just in the whole area of church planting. Uh, Pastor Alex has been involved with a lot of church planting uh, through the church that uh, he started over there. And uh, just taking our pastors over, our lighthouse pastors, even recently, uh, getting the chance to just ask a lot of questions and to, to hear him share, even very just uh, transparently and openly, just the challenges that have uh, that he's experienced over the years was actually such an encouragement to us uh, to know that the challenges we're going through are, are the same kind of things that others have gone through as well. So to hear a lot of encouragement was, for me, a personal blessing. And so just over the years, getting to see his faithfulness in ministry, uh, Shepherd's Conference, you usually get to see him, and I know some of you guys have had a chance to go to his seminars over the years, and that's been a blessing as well. So uh, I'm just so thankful that we could have him come to our church and minister to us this weekend. And so hopefully uh, throughout tonight and uh, tomorrow, they're going to have to leave after the afternoon uh, session, but I'm going to encourage you to uh, just go talk to both of them and uh, just get to know them. And uh, it's really just uh, such a blessing that we can have them join us for our retreat this weekend. So without further ado, I want to invite Pastor Alex to come and to, to open up our time in the Word this weekend. So let's give him a warm welcome. John, for this wonderful opportunity to be a part of your great, great church here. It's been a joy for, uh, for me, especially over the years, to have a share in the ministry of Brother John and his wife and family, and to see uh, God uh, raise up another congregation here in L.A. Uh, my wife is back there. We've been married for 49 years. We met when she was two years old, so we uh, have had a chance to be together for for a long time. I have two, uh, two great loves. My first love is obviously my wife. She's been the love of my life for uh, quite some time. We met in high school. We were, uh, in the, were in the high school band. She played the clarinet and I played saxophone. So we had a chance to meet there. And uh, I um, fell in love with her at first sight. And uh, we sat across. If you ever play in a high school band, you know that uh, saxophones and clarinets are opposites. We're looking at each other. So we had a chance to always look at her and not even play my instrument, just fake it, you know, most of the time. But God, uh, that allowed us to get to know each other, and uh, we got married uh, after six years of uh, back and forth. We went to college, and after college, we got a chance to get married. And that's when I met my second, my second love, which is the church. And God brought us to a, a place called First Fundamental Bible Church, located in East L.A., there by, uh, right uh, under the shadow of uh, Cal State L.A., you can almost, uh, almost see the buildings from our church, church location. And that became, uh, became my second love, to love the church. And God has kept us there now for 45 years of being the pastor of that particular church. We, uh, we grew up in East L.A. there and spent about eight years there and moved from there to Monterey Park and spent, spent 25 years in Monterey Park and then finally we uh, re reached the Promised Land, which is the city of Whittier, and we've been there for the last nine years. And so it's been a wonderful, wonderful <coughs> journey. So when Pastor John asked me to come and speak uh, at your retreat, at your special anniversary, it was a real uh, joy and delight to be with you. And then especially when he assigned a topic for me, uh, he asked me to speak on the conduct, the conduct of the church. And so it falls right in line with my, uh, my great love for the church, the fact that we can spend God time this weekend, today and tomorrow, uh, thinking about the conduct of the church. 
If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you've had a chance to taste the, the message that we just sang about in our song service, if Christ has come into your life and, and saved you and changed you, transformed you, and made you a part of the body of Christ, then you have a very special privilege to belong to Jesus Christ and to belong to the church. If you're not a Christian and you're here with us, we're so delighted to have you in our midst because you have an opportunity to see you know, Christians in action and to kind of look and see what God does in the lives of individuals and to hear the Word of God and to see what God's Word has to say about your particular life. And it will be our prayer that as we go through the, uh, through the weekend, not only today, tomorrow and Sunday as well, that you'll get a taste of what it means for God to love you and for God to send His Son to be your Savior. And then for you to come to know Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior. And that will be our greatest desire and greatest joy to see you come to know Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles uh, right now to the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 3. We are going to be spending most of our time in our sessions in the Word of God. So I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3. In a crowd like this, perhaps I'm going to ask you to open your cell phones or your iPads to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3. And uh, uh, our thoughts are coming down to verse 14, 15, and 16 of chapter 3. 14, 15, and 16. I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He was revealed in the flesh, was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. This epistle was written by the Apostle Paul, which, as you know, is probably the greatest Christian that ever lived. If you're looking for a, for a hero, look for someone to look up to, I recommend the Apostle Paul, in my estimation, the greatest Christian that ever lived. And God used Paul to introduce Christ to a number, a number of churches, <clears throat> a number of areas. And he had a particular disciple that he he had raised, he was a young man by the name of Timothy, and Timothy became, became his key disciple, and, and so he wrote, he wrote to Timothy two epistles, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. 1 Timothy, when uh, he was still very much in the early part of the ministry, and then 2 Timothy was at his last days, when he was about to be crucified, about to be put to death for the cause of Christ, he wrote Timothy a final, final exhortation. But in the first epistle, what he sat down was to give Timothy a blueprint. A blueprint. You see, it was Timothy's job to go about from place to place and be part of a church planting team. Kind of like Pastor, Pastor John and the team that joined him to plant this particular church, Lighthouse LA. And, and Timothy had kind of the same function, to be part of a church planting team and to go about planting churches. Now, in doing so, Timothy also had to learn a few things along the way. And so what he provided in chapter, in these six chapters of 1 Timothy, is kind of a blueprint, a blueprint on the church, on the conduct of the Christian in the local church. What do I do now that I'm a Christian? How do I function as a believer in the body of Christ? What are the, what are the ABCs? What are the do's and don'ts of functioning as an effective Christian in the local church? And so what what the Apostle Paul then started to do here is to produce a, a manual of Christian conduct. Here's how you conduct yourself in the church. And so Paul and Timothy, as you plant these churches, as you instruct them, here is what you, what you tell them in, re, in regards to that, which is so key, because every, every institution has a code of conduct. Every, everything that, that's, that's a value and worth has a code of conduct. Uh, you know, I was, uh, this is our first time in, in this, uh, this retreat place. And uh, if you, uh, I don't know if, if your room is like our room, uh, I was, I was on the door there is a couple of sheets of paper. One of them is, has to do with some of the uh, regulations of the, of the uh, state. And the other are the code of conduct for those that use this particular retreat place. 
And so, did you get a chance to read that? And, and so, basically, you know, we're here in, in the, as, as the guest of Calvary Chapel organization, and they have a code of conduct for this particular place. And every institution has the same thing. Uh, my wife and I, we have two children, a son and a daughter, and they're both married, and we have five, grand, five grandkids. Our oldest just joined the Navy. And so he's, uh, he's like four months into the Navy, and uh, he's been radically transformed. I mean, uh, before he went into the, into the Navy, he was a hang loose kind of a guy, you know, loved soccer, loved to watch TV, hated to study, you know what I'm saying? Like some of you. And, uh, and uh, you know, rather, uh, rather laid back in his approach to life. And lo and behold, if he doesn't join the armed services, and you know, they cracked the whip there. And in four, uh, in, in, in three months, he joined in August, so this is now the end of October. They've changed this guy. I mean, he's a totally different dude. You know what I'm saying? He like uh, he's organized. Like he wakes up early. He studies now, and he has to wear a uniform. He has different types of uniforms, and uh, so he has a he has to live by a, by a code of conduct. They even tell him, you know, how to wear what to, what to wear and how to wear it and how to, how to dress, and etc. In other words, there's a code of conduct. If you're going to be a great, a great serviceman, a great service person, you have to abide by a certain code of conduct. And it's much the same thing for the Christian church. The fact that God has given us in His Word a code of conduct, how we ought to conduct ourselves in the church of the living God, which is the pillar of support of the truth. And so you and I, in God's Word, have been given then a, 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 a code of conduct how we ought to conduct ourselves in the church of the living God. And I'd like us to think about that for the next, uh, the next three, th three sessions that we have together. Tonight we'll talk about the nature of the church. What is it like? We, we become Christians, but what is it like to belong to a church? What is a church composed of? What is the nature, the character, qualities of a church. And then tomorrow morning we'll talk about the actual purpose of the church, why Christ established the church. And then in the after session we'll talk about how we can build a, a great healthy church. How Lighthouse can be a, a great, great church for the glory of God. And so I brought a special exhortation just for this church that I would uh, want to give you as your friend as your friend, and how you can uh, take what we have today and, and then go home and build a great, great lighthouse there in L.A. for the glory of God. So let's begin by, by just looking at the nature of the church, and, and Paul here talks about that. Now in, in, your, uh, in your brochures, your, low, your yellow brochures, we have an outline that you can follow along that will help us with our, our particular bullet points as we move through the discussion. The nature of the church is such that it is a mystery in the New Testament. What I'm saying is that the church is a brand new institution that God established. The church is something that came with the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ introduced it. If you have your Bibles, for example, your Bibles, you'll find that if you look at the Old Testament, from Genesis to Malachi, there is no reference to the church. There is no reference to the church. The reference to the church begins in the New Testament. It is called a mystery. The word mysterion in the Bible is something that is hidden, that cannot be understood except God make it known to us. Let me take you to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3. Please open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3 for just a moment. Ephesians chapter 3. The book of Ephesians is the book on the church. Uh, it's a condensed version that explains what the church is and um, what it is to accomplish. In chapter 3, verse 1, he says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, that is, non-Jews, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace which is given to me for you, that by revelation, that is, by God making known to, known to me, there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief. But referring to this, 
when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body, and fellow partakers of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace which is given to me according to the working of his power. You see, if you know the Bible, you know that the Old Testament is dealing with God's people which is the Jewish nation. And so there were the Jews and the Gentiles and separated. The Jews were God's chosen people. And they were chosen by God to take the light of the truth to the Gentiles, to the nations. And that was God's plan in the Old Testament. That's why when Jesus came, he said, I've come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I came to minister to them. Now you know what happened when, when the Jews rejected Jesus Christ, when they crucified the Messiah, and they disowned the king. Then the Lord, uh, the Lord uh, introduced in human history, the mystery that is the church, composed of both Jews and Gentiles coming together and becoming one body and equal with no distinction. In the church there's neither Jew nor Gentile. In the church there is one entirely new body composed of Jews and Gentiles, and that is the mystery of the New Testament. It is called the mystery because, you see, Christ revealed it to the apostles that now Jews and Gentiles are one in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the church then is something brand new. The church is something brand new, composed of Jews and Gentiles. And that's the church that we belong to. It is something that God made, and it's something new. So when you want to find out about the church, you don't go to the Old Testament. Where do you go? Okay, now you need to help me, because where I come from, when I ask a question, <laughs> people talk back. Okay, so pretend you're at first fundamental, all right? So when I ask a question, what do you do? Respond. Yeah, yeah, so you respond. No, don't say hi. <laughs> all right, so composed of Jews and Gentiles. And, and so this is the church. So when, so when Paul says, you know, Timothy, in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one is to conduct himself in the in the household of faith, the household of God, which is something entirely new, composed of both what? Jews and Gentiles. Gentiles. Everybody who comes to Christ has equal footing. And so now it's, it's a distinct entity, a distinct creation of God called a mystery that is revealed to by God to the apostles and that's who we are. And so it is this church then that is called the household of God. It is a community of believers. Say it. Amen. That's who we are. It's called the household of God. In other words, a family. A family. You know, when, when people come to our church, uh, one of the things they say as, we, uh, as they interact with us, they say, it seems like, it seems like you people are a family. And the answer is what? Yeah, because we are. See, God has made us a family because when you come to Christ, you become members of the household of faith, the household of God. It is a community, community of believers. I want you to keep that in mind, a community of believers. That's what God, Christ makes us. So even though my wife and I, you know, we just are here tonight, we have just met most of you. You're really our family, are we not? You know, you know, we're together. We're 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 part part of your family. I asked, uh, I asked Pastor John, who's the oldest person in your church? And guess what he said? He said, my wife is. Oh. <laughs> I said, and who's the second oldest? He goes, I am. Well, you know, he, I think they're in their fifties, are they not? Their late fifties, well, I guess. <laughs> or is it early fifties? Yeah, this is early fifties. Early fifties. 
then it means that my wife and I should be your grandparents, right? <laughs> Basically, or I should be your grandfather. She's not old enough to do that yet. But so, so the issue is, is it, it, so that's who we are. So the church is an entirely new creation of God. And we then, by God's grace, have been made members of that when you and I come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now, now, to help us appreciate that, I want you to look at your notes for a few moments because I've, I've taken the idea of the redeemed community of believers or the household of God and, uh, and, 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 and talked about this community for a few moments of what, what does it look like? What is it? And just to help us appreciate who we are. See, sometimes we don't appreciate family because we don't understand family. But once you look at God's Word and you examine what God says about the church and about this community of believers, you begin to appreciate who we are, you know, as part of God's family. And I have chosen a few of these expressions because, you see, in the, in the Bible, you know, for example, here in our text, he says the household of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. Notice the different metaphors that he uses. The idea of the fact that it's a, a family, the fact that it's a building with pillars, the fact that it's the church of the living God, the <coughs> called out assembly of people that belong to the living God. And then he uses a whole lot of other metaphors to help us understand little pictures to <coughs> appreciate the church that God has given us and the fact that we belong to this family. Notice, first of all, it's called a, a redeemed community. A redeemed community in the fact that it's, it's a community that's been redeemed or purchased by the, by the blood and, and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, are you still in Ephesians? Let me take you to chapter 5. Chapter 5. When Paul describes the instructions for marriage in chapter 5 of Ephesians, and uh, he, he goes on to say in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also, what? Loved the church and gave himself for it, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. That he might present the church to himself in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but as she would be holy and blameless. The illustration here is that she's like a bride, a bride that belongs to Christ, but that he that he actually purchased as a bride. He bought her, and then he washed her and cleansed her and made her special just for himself. That's called redemption. That's called redemption. You know, we were all lost in sin, are we not? We all had rebelled against God, every last one of us. Without Christ, we were doomed to, to a, an eternity without Jesus Christ, called hell. And yet, because God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, who gave His life for us, that's called redemption. He redeemed us, He bought us, and so then we belong to Him. Go to Acts chapter 20, the book of Acts chapter 20. The Apostle Paul, in Acts chapter 20, says this about, about the church, Acts 20 and verse 28. Speaking to the elders, he says to them, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he finishes. Say which he purchased with his own blood. Right? Acts 20, 28. That is, Jesus paid for the church with what? With his own blood. With his own blood. Now, think about that. When we talk about our, a redeemed community, we're talking about something that has been purchased, redeemed, by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's nothing more precious than the actual Son of God. There's nothing in this whole universe that has more value than the Son of God. And you and I have been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's a redeemed community. A redeemed community. So let me ask you, 
How much are you worth then? What is, what is the price of the church? The blood, of the blood of Christ. And how precious is the blood of Christ? It's priceless, right? It is priceless. In other words, <coughs> sometimes, you know, we have a tendency to look at ourselves and to minimize our worth. To think that somehow we have no value. It's that somehow that, you know, we're insignificant. We need to understand that the Church of Christ is a redeemed community and that Christ redeemed us with, the, with His own blood. Therefore, you and I belong to an institution that is entirely, entirely priceless. Priceless. We're redeemed. And Christ redeemed us with the price of His own personal blood. And that should make us stop and think about the church that, that we belong to. That it is a, it is something that, in essence, is entirely priceless. Notice, secondly, it is also what I call a visible community. It is called the people of God. The church is visible. You know, Jesus once gave this. He gave a parable of the of the wheat and the tares. Remember that parable that Jesus gave in Matthew 13? A, a fellow sowed wheat, and, and and during the night his enemy came and sowed so weeds among the wheat and then they began to grow and before before long the the, the workers said you know boss didn't didn't you sow wheat he goes yeah well you know why there are all these weeds growing along with the wheat what happened oh he says an enemy has done this he said would you like us to go in and take all the weeds out he says no because if you do that you're going to tear out some of the good wheat and so just leave them alone and at the end of the age when we harvest the wheat will separate the wheat from the weeds. We'll put the wheat in the, in, the, in the barn and we'll burn the weeds with fire. There'll be a separation. And by that illustration, the Lord began to show us that the church of God is going to always be visible. It is an organization. In other words, it is something you, you see, something you identify with. You identify with. Uh, it's interesting, like tonight, we went out to dinner, and uh, my wife and I were like, uh, we were the vanguards for Lighthouse, okay? Because there was a section set aside for Lighthouse Bible Church. And, uh, but we had to go past a number of other churches. Brother, Pastor John, you know, there were names of all this, about maybe a dozen churches here, right? At least a dozen churches, because we saw a dozen signs on all these tables. And then we're looking for Lighthouse, and they had us way in the back, you know, in a place all reserved, all, and they're, they're visible, in other words. These churches are visible. I say that because every now and then we have a tendency to think that I can be an invisible Christian. Kind of a CIA, you know, idea, you know. Something that's invisible, something where I'm, I'm incognito. I don't want to become manifest. I don't want to be, be obvious. Friend, you cannot help but be obvious. Because the Church of Christ is always going to be a visible identity, something visible before the Lord Jesus Christ. See, we are then the, we're then the people of God. We're a people of God that have a, a visible status for them. And so we have, we have never, never think that somehow we have to be ashamed and hide ourselves from belonging to the body of Christ, because that is not the case at all. We need to become visible. We are visible. It is something that people are going to see. They're going to, they're going to, we're going to be worshiping God. We're going to be serving Him. It's going to be something especially, especially visible. And so we, we recognize that. That when you become a Christian, you cannot, be, you cannot be a Christian as a hidden believer. You become identified. And we'll talk about that more tomorrow. But it's a symbol of being identified. And, you do, and so there's a sense where you become a Christian, you're going to manifest yourself because the church of Jesus Christ is always a visible assembly. It is visible. It is out there. You know, there's a story told about, you've heard recently about the Coptic church in, in Egypt that the terrorists have come in and began to persecute the Coptic Christians. Well, they said that they captured about 
20, 22 of these Christians, and they, they had to kneel before these terrorists, and they asked them one by one if they were professing Christians. And they had to say yes or no. And as, as they began to say yes one by one, they were decapitated one by one as they professed their faith in Jesus Christ. When they came to the last man, there was a one last man that was taken by accident. He was not even a Christian. They just took him by accident, and he was the last one. But seeing the process of these people confessing their faith in Jesus Christ, when they came and they asked him, are you a Christian? He said, yes. He was converted by the testimony of the other people that were willing to, to identify publicly with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was put to death as a martyr for the Lord Jesus Christ. What would you think would have happened if all these 21 Christians had, had denied Christ or wanted to be incognito or didn't want to become visible? Or the 22nd man would have never come to faith in Christ. See, it is the public testimony. The public testimony. That's why, that's why when I preface my remarks tonight about anybody among us who's not a Christian, we're glad you're here. Because you need to see what we're like. You need to see the real thing. And then when you see the real thing, then you'll come to faith in Jesus. I recall like. Uh, Brother John, about 30 years ago, we had this wife that came to Christ, and then her husband came. And he sat in the second pew, like, you're the wife, and she, he sat there. And he would sit there, and he would just be looking around. He would be, like, turning around and looking at all the people. When they sang, he'd be looking at them singing. He was just checking people out. And he was like, whoa, this dude's checking them out. He did that for about three weeks. Three weeks just checking people out. And after three weeks, he gave his life to Christ. Because he saw the real thing. <coughs> he saw the real thing, and when you see the real thing, friend, you come to believe in it. You see, when we, when we say we are Christians, we belong to a, a visible assembly, something that we feel, something we see, something that is there, that, that's not ever in secret. Notice also, thirdly, that it's a, a living community the church is not only an organization, it is an organism. An organism. Now you can go back to your you know, college days and biology and etc. And an organism is something that has life on its own. The church has life on its own. It is, it is energized by God himself. That's what is called the church of the living God. Is God alive? Yeah. Talk to me. Yeah. Yes, are you alive? Yes. <laughs> yeah. oh, almost, okay. So the issue is, the church is the living God, and therefore, it is the living God that gives life to the church. And that's why the, the church is an organism. It's not just an organization that's visible. It is an organism. That's why when Jesus, when Jesus said in Matthew 16, the very first reference to the church is given to us in Matthew 16 and 18. When he said, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In other words, it will never die. Our church will never die. Why? Because it is a living organism. It is life in itself. The church lives because Christ lives. It is interesting, you see, Lighthouse Bible Church is God's church. And if tomorrow, you know, Pastor John was to, if the Lord took him, or took his wife, or took some of your leaders... Would the church die? No. It's, a, it's an organism. It is life of its own. There's something there that allows it to continue and live this way. It will, it will never, never, never die. It is a living, living community. The metaphor that God uses it for the church is the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And the body is a living organism. You know, it... It lives, it breathes, it has members in it, it has a head, you know, it's, it has a purpose for it. And that's the church, the church is a living organism. This is why your life and my life is not dependent upon us, it depends upon Christ, upon the living God that gives us life, that continues to sustain us and 
we belong to the body of Christ. And we'll speak more about them when we talk about the purpose of the church, but keep that in mind that it is a, it is a living organism. This is why no matter what happens, the church will never die. It'll never die. Because it, it's the life of the church is God himself. And that's why it'll be the ultimate, ultimate victorious organism because it is, has life within itself. I want you to see also that it is a, it is a holy community. It's, it's, it's a holy community. Let me take you to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 for just a moment. A couple of references just to help us identify this church. In chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, and um, in verse 16, he wants to address the holiness of this thing called the church. In 1 Corinthians 3, 16, do you not know that you are a what? Talk to me. A temple of God, a temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells where? In you. If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. Now, keep in mind, there are two times in Corinthians when, when God uses the expression, you are the temple of God. In chapter 6, he says, your body is the temple of God. Your physical body is the temple of God. This expression here is not your body. This expression is the church. The church of Christ is the temple of God. And the temple of God is that place where God dwells. Where God dwells. Okay, if you were, uh, if you were at the dinner, the gentleman that prayed for us, prayed a prayer, something like this, God, make yourself known to us. Remember that? Make yourself known to us in this retreat place. Well, friend, you know, God can't help but make himself known to us because he inhabits his church. You know, this is his. He indwells the church. But when he does that, when God indwells, whatever God indwells, he sanctifies. That is, he makes it holy. And that is what the church is. The church is a holy, holy institution that is free from sin, free from contamination, it is, it is sacred to God, it is, its conduct has to be free from sin and free from anything that would mar the holy nature of God. That's why sin, sin and, and God are incompatible. This is why sin and the church are also incompatible. The church then is going to be a holy institution set apart for God. Now, this is, now follow me, this, this is the one thing that really sets aside the church as an institution from any other institution in this world, whether it be governments or whatever the case might be. What set, sets apart the church from all other institutions is this, the church is to be holy. It is holy. By its very nature, it is holy. And that's what sets aside the church from every other institution that holiness is a requirement for God's church. Never can we ever tolerate sin in the body of Christ. We are to be holy. And that's the nature of the church. This is why wherever the church is, it always affects, it always affects, you know, our, our, our environment. It, it affects those around it. It affects those that come in. Because the church is to be holy. And this is the nature of the church. That's what distinguishes it from all other institutions. When the church loses its holiness, then it loses its character quality. It loses its identity. And it no longer then represents the true, true body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Holiness is so more. That's why here, Jesus, the, the Apostle Paul says, you mess with my church, you're messing with God. And if you mess with God, He will deal with you. He will deal with you. You know, so I was talking to a young man once, Pastor John, I was talking to one man. He wanted to, uh, wanted to divide the church. He was a young seminarian, and he got his, uh, 
he was he was more like Jack in the Box with the big head, you know, and wanted to, he thought he was big big cheese. He thought it was the big cheese, and he wanted to do things right. And he came for my, my advice. He said, you know. Montoya, I want to go, my pastor's not doing the right thing, I want to go set him straight, I think he needs to go, I should take this place, da 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 And I said, wait, wait, wait a minute. Then I read in this verse, I said, you don't want to do that. You mess with God's church, you mess with, messing with, with him, and he will deal with you. If I, if I was you, I would leave things the way they are. Just let God deal with his church. Don't you mess with it. Because you mess with, you mess with God's church, and you'll suffer the consequences of it. You see, it's in the text. It is a sacred, holy institution. And, and this is why in the church, you'll find that in the church, we cannot ever tolerate sin. Never. It is holy. It is holy. And though we are a church composed of unholy people, the process that God is doing in our lives is making us holy people. That's the whole process of it. And so we are then a, a temple of the living God. God dwells in us. And wherever God dwells, that is His place. It is sacred, and it belongs to God. It belongs to God. Now, I say that because, you see, there may be a temptation among us to treat the church like it was just any other institution, to minimize it, to uh, many times depreciate what it is. And, and sometimes to the point of abusing it or bad-mouthing it, understand that the church is the temple of the living God. It belongs to Him. It is His. And therefore, always regard it from that point and make sure that your life and my life are always holy because we belong to a holy institution. Notice also, it is a, it is a worshiping community. The church is set aside to worship God. Go to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2. This is, uh, again, 1 Peter 2. And notice all the metaphors that God is using to describe the church. It is such a, a, a rich institution that he has to use all these metaphors to help us understand who we really are. He says in verse, uh, in verse 4, And coming to him, chapter 2, verse 4 of 1 Peter, And coming to him as a, as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also, as what kind of stones? Living, Living stones are being built up to a, what kind of house? Spiritual, Spiritual house for a holy, what? Priesthood to offer up what kind of sacrifices? Spiritual, Spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That is the whole the church, then, is a worshiping community. We're always, then, worshiping God. We're giving God the glory. It isn't just in song. It is in all that we do. Everything that we do is done for the glory of God. Go to verse 9. Go down, drop down to verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Look at all the metaphors. A people for God's own possession. Here's what. So that... You may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Our job, our the whole purpose of the church is a worshiping community to extol who God is, to magnify Him. Listen, we are here to make God look what good. We are here to make God. Look good. Now you say it. See, our temptation is we are here to make ourselves look good. Yeah. I mean, I wore I wore my light house shirt to make myself look good. I I wore my Dodger shirt to wear, you know, to make my team look good. Listen, listen. We are here to make who look good? God. That's the whole purpose of the church to make God look good. It's a worshiping community. That's why we worship God. That's the whole purpose of it. We exist for the glory of God. That's why pagan people, unbelievers, especially California people, they have no idea what's going on. They're like, they're like, wacko. They look at us and they want us to like fit their agenda, you know, fit the 
liberal agenda and the pagan agenda, you know what? It's spin on you. No. No. We're not here for you. We're not here for your agenda. We're here to make God look good. That's what it's all about. We're here to worship God, to make God who is already King of kings and Lord of lords, who does whatsoever he pleases, who is almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-sufficient. That's who God is. <laughs> who, who doesn't need anybody. He doesn't need any one of us. And yet, he calls us into existence to make him look good. You know, there's a, there's a plant called the sunflower, from which we get sunflower seeds. Anybody like sunflower seeds? Yeah, you hear the one that makes all the messes, huh? You they can spit them out, yeah. Sunflower seeds. Well, the, 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 uh, the Spanish word for sunflower is mirasol. Mirasol, which means you look at the sun. And it's interesting that the sunflower, sunflower, when the sun rises, it follows the sun throughout the day. It follows the sun. And that's what it does. It's, it just follows the sun. It says that the fuller the head becomes full of sunflower seeds, it bends because of the weight. And in doing so, reflects its great humility before the sun. It gave us the ability to produce such great fruitfulness. And that is us. That's the church. We exist for the glory of God. And to thank Him for all His provision for us and what He's done for us. We forget that sometimes. We forget, we think it's about us. Not about us. It's about who? God. Think about that. It's not about us. It's about God. And when you realize that it's about God, then everything changes because we exist for the glory of God. It's all about Him and not about us. Now, there's another metaphor that he uses, which is called the shepherd. And so it is a, a community that is protected by God. It's a protected community. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd does what? gives his life for the sheep. John 10. He says, I'm the good shepherd. My sheep know me and I know them. And they will never perish. And I will give them eternal life. You see, it is, it is this, this community that is a protected community. <coughs> that, that is protected by the power of God. First Peter First Peter 1 and 2 Peter 1 speak about that. It is protected by the power of God. Jesus says, all that the God, Father has given me, you know, are mine. And no one can snatch them out of my hand. The church is in the hands of God. And no one can snatch us out of the hand of the living God. It's a protected community. It's, it's designed. It's designed for us to look at and see, realize that this church, you know, it's in the hand of God. And as much as people try to destroy, destroy the church, there was back in the 17th century a great atheist by the name of Voltaire. And he wrote some powerful, powerful books. He was a great learned man. And he had a vendetta against the Christian church. It was his, it was his goal to destroy the Christian church. But think of God's humor. Think of God's humor. It was out of Voltaire's house when he died, that they set up a printing press to print Bibles to distribute around the world. Figure that one out. Who won that battle? God did. God did. Voltaire destroyed nothing. God used his home to spread the Word of God. It's interesting. Can I borrow your Bible? It's interesting. This mine's up there and I don't want to get it. It's interesting. <laughs> this is a 66 books of the Bible. We start from the beginning to the end, and it makes for long, long reading. Huh? It makes for long reading. And, and you can read just know what I'm talking about, because sometimes you will skim, and then you'll turn to the end and get the final story. Well, this guy, this guy cheated. He said, Pastor, um, I didn't get a chance to read all the Bible, but I did do this. I, I read the last few chapters, and you know what? We win. We win 
Because it is this way. The last two chapters. See, the first two chapters begin in a garden. And the last two chapters end in a garden. The first two chapters, they get kicked out of a garden. And the last two chapters, they're preserved in the garden of God for all eternity. See, this is what, this is the church that we belong to. This is the church of the living God. This is, this is who we are. So when you, when you think of the fact that you're a brand new Christian or you've been a Christian for a while, and, and you belong to this thing called the church, now you realize that it's not just some, some little thing, some little meager institution, some weak, you know, anemic, you know, faltering, feeble, etc. It is not that at all. It is a choice, a choice organism, a choice institution, a choice body, redeemed by the very blood of Jesus Christ, which is absolutely priceless. This is what the church is, and God has given us the privilege of belonging to that. It becomes the pillar and support of the truth. It becomes the basis from which you and I, you know, are going to understand all that God has to offer us here in the truth that we're going to believe. It is the sphere of our existence. We live in this thing called the church. That's who we are. You know, if one of the things that, that God's going to impress upon you and my wife and I have experienced it in our lives, is that the church is our life. Not because I'm the pastor, but because I'm a Christian and she's a Christian and we belong to the church. It is the sphere of our life. You see, we don't just go to church, we are the church. Did you get that? We don't just go to church, we are the church. The problem with some of us is that we go to church and then we go someplace else and our activity changes, our life changes. We kind of live a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. We kind of live a schizophrenic existence. We're one thing in church and then something else outside. Because we forget that the sphere of our existence is always the church. We are never not the church. We're always the church. And thereby, that becomes our life. And when you begin to see that, understand that, you realize that this is, it's normal then for us to be who we are 24-7 and seven days a week for the, all of your life. This is what God has made us. And so understand that in regards to that. Understand that, that this is the sphere of our activity. So this is, this is why our conduct is so important because God is going to be speaking to us in relation to that. And so let me, let me just... Remind us tonight of who you are when you become a Christian. You become a member of the household of God, a community of believers. And God has to use all these metaphors to help us understand just who we are in our Lord Jesus Christ. And then walk away from that saying, wow, God, thank you. That's who I am. That's what the church is all about. And you've called me and given me the privilege to belong to the body of Jesus Christ. So we'll talk about more of that tomorrow. We'll talk about the purpose of the church in more detail in relation to that. Let's pray at this time. Lord, we thank you so much. We thank you as we stop to give you thanks and praise. I think of the Apostle Paul that twice in Ephesians when... He wrote about your church. He just stops and he, he prays. Prays in chapter 1 and prays again in chapter 3 and just...